So staying overseas, people in Russia are back in the office this week after the government ordered workers to stay home for several days. It was part of an effort to stop the spread of the coronavirus. The country is grappling with high infections and death numbers, which are not going down despite the shutdown. Today, health officials reported a record daily death total of more than 1,200 people. And this comes amid a less than enthusiastic response to the vaccine rollout. So CBS News reporter Mary Ilyushina joins us now from Moscow with more on this. Uh, thanks for joining us. You know, I remember early on in the pandemic, uh, Sputnik uh, V came out and there was this idea that um, Russia was kind of s surging ahead of the rest of the world in terms of tackling this virus. And now we see a surge of a different sort. Um, so as a result, President Putin announced last month that from October 30th to November 7th, uh, we we, uh, there would be a paid non-working days. He wanted workers to stay home. They would still get paid in an attempt to slow down the surge. Can you tell us more about this? Yeah, sure. The Russian president basically agreed with the decision of the head doctor who proposed this non-working week, as Russian officials call it, which is essentially a lockdown or a semi-lockdown, but they're avoiding to use this term because it sounds really serious and strict. Um, and they've decided to shut down pretty much all the entertainment venues, restaurants, bars, gyms, give office workers an additional time off and give holiday um, holidays to school kids and students in order to try and sort of break and turn around this wave. Um, but some regions chose actually to prolong this period. They thought it's not enough um, to change the situation and turn um, the wave around. So some regions in Russia are still continuing with this lockdown. But most of Russia returned back to work, as you've said, uh, and the semi-lockdown is back, is, is over. And um, the, we've seen still pretty high cases daily. Um, every day, Russia has been reporting around 40,000 new cases, and that number hasn't gone down. Well, I noticed you uh, use the word semi. You call it a semi-lockdown. It certainly sounds much better when you say it's a holiday, a school holiday. But the, one of the issues with this is that the restrictions stopped Russians from working but didn't actually tell them not to travel or socialize. Um, so how well did the restriction work then? Did people still move around? People moved around. You know, I live in Moscow and the traffic was as bad as it usually is. Um, some people did not go to office, but a lot of people decided to hang out in the parks and go to their summer houses and vacation houses. Um, tickets uh, to some of the vacation spots in Russia were sold out for the semi-lockdown week, um, especially in Sochi, even though there are restrictions in place. But Russians flock to the sea um, and use this holiday um, instead of actually sitting home and not communicating with each other. So the authorities, even though they've lifted um, the semi-lockdown, they are now faced with a big problem of basically how to really do something to break those down, to bring those numbers down. And so far, they haven't come up with a good solution. Yeah, because I think if there's anything that we have learned over the last 20 months or so is that you can't just do one thing. It has to be kind of a layered approach. Um, and, and so I'm wondering, you know, why the hesitation to have a complete lockdown, to tell people, listen, don't visit your loved ones. Let's just, you know, spend two weeks and slow the spread. It, it, do, do Russians just not have you know, a taste for a lockdown? It, it, is the thinking that there would be too much pushback? Yeah, the authorities, we had, the authorities imposed a really strict lockdown last year uh, during the spring, and that mm -hmm. proved to be very unpopular with Russians. Uh, the ratings mm -hmm. for President Vladimir Putin and for the ruling party went down significantly because Russians were really unhappy with those measures, um, in part because of the economic toll. A lot of people, you know, they were sent home, they stayed um, for several weeks, for about two months in lockdown. Some of them uh, lost jobs, small businesses closed down. There was very little financial help from the government. So people feel that um, discontent when they think that you know lockdown might happen again and they might lose even more uh, money, business, job opportunities. So they're very reluctant to actually abide with those things. And the authorities understand that. And they, they have repeatedly said they do prioritize um, economy over lockdowns and coronavirus. And they've said they don't think that lockdown mm -hmm. is worth it, essentially, because the people are losing so much money. And that affects the popularity of the authorities here as well. 
So the government has been very reluctant, but at the same time, um, we, as we've seen, the messaging was really controversial and very sort of all over the place from the government. Because um, at the beginning of the pandemic, the authorities have been saying that coronavirus is not worse than the flu or that it affects only the Chinese people. And now, you know, Russians, you know, they've stuck with this message because they've heard it from the beginning. And now they don't understand why all of a sudden coronavirus is real. So a lot of people here just don't believe when the authorities now say that, look, it's very dangerous and you have to stay home, they don't, they dismiss it as something that is not as serious as it really is. That is so interesting. So we have this vaccine. Russia was one of the first countries to come out with a vaccine. Um, but I presume that they don't have any sort of vaccine mandates in the country. What percentage of the population has been vaccinated? And I know it's not particularly high. So, so my next question is, do people not trust the vaccine? Yeah, right now it's about 39% of the total population of Russia that has uh, received the two shots, so they're fully vaccinated, which is a pretty low number if you think about it, because the vaccine was registered in August 2020. That's a very significant time, and you know it was publicly available pretty much in every clinic since the beginning of this year. You know, Russia has experienced some production issues, but then they've sort of managed to supply enough doses for people to get vaccinated. But we still see a lot of hesitation among Russians to get the shot, and it's explained by a variety of things. Uh, most common. Um, reason, according to like opinion polls and experts that we've been talking to, is that Russians generally do not trust government initiatives. Um, they don't trust that whatever government is doing is for their good. And, you know, a lot of people we've been talking to are saying, you know, if there's a freely available vaccine, there must be something wrong with it because um, the government wouldn't really necessarily consider our benefit above it all. So there is a lot of mistrust of the government and of the vaccine itself, because it was registered first, but it was registered after only first and second phase of the trial, which, as we know, is not mass trials. You know, it was only tried on several dozen people. Yes. And a lot of people have been very concerned about it because they don't think it was tested enough and it was approved too quickly. A lot of people are afraid of side effects. And another group of people is also not... Uh, willing to take the vaccine because they don't really believe coronavirus is that bad. So there are several reasons piling on top of each other, and we're seeing a, still a really dragging and stalling vaccine rollout. Hmm. I mean, all reasons that, quite frankly, I'm familiar with because we hear it here in this country as well, though the vaccination rates are higher. Listen, before I let you go, I just want to ask you quickly about another topic having to do with Russia. Mm -hmm. um, the tension between Russia and Ukraine on energy. As an exporter of electricity, Ukraine sort of finds itself in a tough spot as Russia has prohibited its export. Can you break down the conflict uh, for me and just give us a sense of where things stand currently? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. The conflict basically stems decades ago, and Russia has always been um, a very crucial supplier of gas um, to Ukraine. And Ukraine actually depends on um, depended on the transit of Russian gas to Europe, and that accounted for a very significant part of Ukrainian budget. Um, but now, as we know, Russia sort of um, you know pushed Ukraine out of this market because they've built a Nord Stream 2, which Germany was very interested in, to circumvent Ukraine and leave it without this very crucial revenue for them. Um, and Ukrainian officials have been pressing uh, European officials and President Biden as well to reconsider um, allowing this pipeline to function. And, you know, President Volodymyr Zelensky has repeatedly asked Joe Biden to reconsider his decision to not impose sanctions on that pipeline. Um, which, as we know, you know, he decided to waive in the spring in order to sort of build up a relationship with Germany that has been severed during the Trump administration years. Uh, so now Ukraine finds itself in a really, really tough spot. And of course, this gas crisis that we've seen in Ukraine, in Moldova, generally in EU, the soaring prices for gas um, have been a gift to President Putin because, you know, he now um, gets to sell his main commodity, which is gas, and supply Europe with crucial energy. And he can show that this pipeline is not going away, and it's pretty much a done deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, this is a topic I'm sure we will revisit with you at some point. Mary, thank you very much. Thank you.